Joey, Joey Krug, so great to have you here. Thanks so much for joining me on Block by Block. Thanks for having me. You've recently made a big move, and I want to dig into that um, a bit more. And, but first, for our listeners, could you share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, yes, I, I got into the space initially just through through Bitcoin mining, and then in 2014, uh, started writing smart contracts on Ethereum, um, created an early project there called Augur, which is like a prediction market platform. And then in 2016, started angel investing, um, invested in kind of some early projects like Zero X and Numeri. Uh, that's sort of how I met the team at Pantera. Uh, I joined Pantera as co-chief investment officer in 2017, um, was there until uh, basically this year, um, which I, at which point I uh, decided to leave and join uh, Founders Fund, where I head up our crypto uh, investing efforts. So I do want to get into Founders Fund a bit later, but I do love the fact that, because Founders Fund didn't before have a crypto focus, right? Yeah, so so in the past, you know, FF basically mostly just bought a bunch of Bitcoin, and then they, they did invest in a handful of deals, like, uh, you know, companies like Starkware, Flashbots, you know, Togomi. Uh, but it was a, a relatively small number. Yeah, this is great. So I'm really happy for you to be there because I think this is a great space for founders to get into. Um, okay, so you're a coder at heart. <clears throat> and I imagine that background continues to have an impact on how you look at opportunities today. So how did you feel when you wrote that first piece of code that worked from a developer standpoint? When it, Does it get excited for you about each product and, and project and you contributing to it? Is that like one of the things that you focus on? Yeah, I mean, well, the very first time I wrote a piece of code um, was was when I was like ten. And I was my, gonna my say, dad, I thought you were like ten. <laughs> uh, yeah, my my dad was like, you know, hey, you should. He taught me how to write a program that just had an infinite loop. That, that I think I think you know said that like you know Joey is awesome or something like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so so yeah, I mean, it's it's really cool when you when you write something and then it like actually works. Um, and I think like you know even even programming now. Um, you always still get that like magic moment. Um, like a, a few weeks ago, I was messing around with the OpenAI API and built this thing where you give it a phone number and you give it some text and, and you tell it to call it and it will try to like, accomplish some conversational goal. Um, you oh, know, like get your cool. information at this restaurant. And um, you know, even there, like like you know, I've been programming for for you know you know well like like almost two decades now at this point, I guess, and. Um, it's still a wow moment when, whenever you get like your code to run and it actually works and it does the thing you wanted it to do. So, in how much do you code today? Not not that much, you know. Like like occasionally, you know, if I if I have free time, I'll do it. Um, I like I'm very obsessive about programming, so like if I try to you know solve some problem, you know, I'll kind of work you know basically nonstop until I do. Uh, so when I program, I don't I don't get a lot of sleep or you know do the do the usual stuff you should probably do. Um, and so I don't, I program, you know, maybe a few times a year just, just for fun at this point. Um, getting to your point about playing around with it, around with code, like from your standpoint, like you, you went to college for a couple of years, you then went to the, and you were a Thiel fellow, you, was it before, was it while you were uh, at Pomona that you actually developed uh, um, Augur or was it afterwards? Uh, after, yes, I, I dropped out basically um, before my sophomore year, you know, it was kind of that, that basically, you know, late, late fall, early winter of, of that year is when, um, we started building Augur. And how did you, like, this was the first ICO on Ethereum, right? Yeah. And how did you come up with that? Like, what was the notion behind like doing this and, and really trying to create this, not just the the um, the platform, but also really thinking about it through the funding mechanism. Yeah, so I mean, the the idea is basically we had we had this um, we had this system where you needed to figure out how a market would be resolved, right? So like you know if if someone run the, won the presidency, who actually became president, um, you know, or or if the Yankees won a game, you know, did they actually win it or not? And uh, that problem, you know, for those in the audience is, is known as the Oracle problem. And we wanted to solve this problem in like a way that's pretty economically secure. Um, and so we created this token called called Reputation, where people basically staked um, in Augur, and you gain reputation if you if you kind of are with consensus, and if you're against consensus, you lose it. Um, and there's kind of this really long, complicated mechanism behind how all of it works. 
but essentially um, part of the mechanism requires the rep token potentially being able to fork into two universes in the event of a really irresolvable dispute. Um, so that's sort of why you need a separate token. And then you get into like, well, um, how do you distribute this token to the world? Um, I don't even think airdrops were really a thing back then. I don't think so. Um, so we never even- And not that airdrops that. necessarily um, ever worked, by the way. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah and that, that's, that's another question. It's like, you know, is, is that even the best way or not? And then, um, yeah, I think we were talking to like Vitalik and he was like, well, you know, with Ethereum, we just auctioned it off. Why don't you just auction it off? Um, and and we are like, okay. Um, and then so he kind of like, you know, went around, talked to people, tried to kind of build awareness of it and then launched this like crowdfunding campaign um, in like the late fall of 2015. Um, raised about five million bucks, and and that's kind of what you know funded Augur and got it you know live into into the world. It's so interesting if you think about the fact that after that, like so much followed, and did things differently, but really followed in the idea of doing these ICOs, and a lot of really interesting companies developed out, out of it. Some maybe not so interesting, uh, but that just must be like fascinating to you to think that this is something that you created in terms of really thinking through this funding mechanism and developing this this platform in Augur to be able to um, to do what you thought was, I mean, I think the notion of having two independent um, like realities is fascinating to me, by the way. But I mean, from the ICO standpoint, is that just like, is it just, how do you think about that? Like that you sort of help to create this notion of of how people could fund themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, you know, one, one, one small, small part of it, but I think, um, the, I think, I think the, the notion was super fascinating, right? Cause like, if you look at something like Augur, um, it was in, it was in a world where basically VCs like didn't like, like they didn't buy tokens back then. Um, and, and also the funding mechanism of like VC. Um, doesn't actually make sense to like sell, like, like you don't want to sell like 20% of your token supply to one person. That's the standard funding structure for VC. Now, obviously the space has evolved since then and VCs are fine owning a few percent of a token, which, which, you know, makes sense. But back then when you would pitch it, people were like, okay, so I want to buy 20% like I would any other startup. Um, and no one like got the concept of like, well, there's not really future dilution. I mean, even if there was, you would basically stake and kind of avoid the dilution. Um, and, and so it kind of like, kicked off a whole wave of these other projects doing this on top of Ethereum. Um, and then I think eventually, you know, VCs realized that, oh, people invest in these things. Some of them actually work. Some of them actually make a lot of money. We should figure out a way to invest in it. And then, that, and then the kind of the markets now evolved. We're like, nobody really does an ICO anymore. For the most part, I mean, the closest thing to it is like Coinlist or Binance Launchpad, yeah. I guess. Um, but I think it's sort of the great returns from the public markets of that, of that space kind of convince VCs that maybe you don't actually have to own 20% of everything you invest into to have a good return, um, which is an interesting dynamic that played that, out. That is, I actually never thought about it that way, but it is, it did take a while for VCs to be comfortable getting into the space in a different way. And it is, that is, it's an interesting concept from that standpoint. Um, with respect to Augur, how did you come up with the notion or what sparked your interest to be able to pull together this notion of predictive like predicting the the future outcome of something, like kind of having people sort of stake on it. Yeah. So um, the the idea there was basically, um, it is it's sort of an old idea. Uh, so I'd always been interested in betting. I used to do a bunch of horse betting when I was a kid, um, and and there's like problems with the betting markets globally, which is that if you start to win too much, they'll they'll often cut you off. Um, and you know, basically say you're no longer welcome to bet here anymore because um, it's not really an exchange model. It's sort of an old school. Basically, all betting sites are like bucket shops. If, if people are familiar with that, um, you know, in the in the 20s when you basically buy and sell stocks, but there's really just some other person taking their side as a bet, and they never actually bought the underlying stock. That's how betting you know works most places. Um, and so the idea behind Augur was basically, you know, what if you had a, a place where you could bet? where it was an exchange. There's a couple of exchanges globally like Betfair and stuff, but they're pretty restricted geography wise. Um, it's mostly the UK and Europe. The liquidity is also not shared. So people betting in Spain are not betting with people in the UK, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, and then the fees are pretty high. You know, you're paying 10% of profits, 50% of profits if you're a market maker. Um, and so the idea is like, what if you would kind of build a system where people could bet on, on anything? 
And then there's one other additional idea, which, which was, I think, interesting, which is like, what if you let people create their own bets? So if you want to bet with your friend on some weird subject that no betting site offers a market on, on Augur, the idea is, you know, you can create that market, um, which, which some people ended up doing. Like you had, you did have some weird stuff on there. Um, for the most like what, part, like what, what's a weird thing? Um, I mean, there, there are like people betting on like, um, I mean, so, some of it was like joke, joke markets, right? Like people made markets on like, you know, like, will the weather, you know, be good, uh, during like the Bastille day parade in, <laughs> in France or whatever, which like that market, which is going to resolve, um, indeterminate, which, which means like the, the odds on both sides are all the 50, 50. So it's kind of like someone was just trolling, um, <laughs> But there's also stuff like, you know, cool stuff that people bet on, like, you know, will SpaceX's next rocket launch be successful? I remember that was like a decently popular market at one point. Um, and stuff like that, I think was pretty interesting. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, the other thing I really like about, I mean, you created the foundation that supported this and or how involved are you today in Augur and the foundation? Yeah, I mean, so, so basically at this point, the, we decided like a year or two ago to kind of transition it uh, do a DAO because from like a development standpoint, it's basically all built. Um, like a, the, the latest version is on Polygon and stuff. It's pretty fast. Um, but we couldn't, you know, since we're based in the U S a lot of the stuff that, that yeah. you know, you'd want to do, like you just can't do. Um, and so maybe, you know, other people can, can kind of take it and, and run with it. Um, and, and kind of like, maybe it can, can flourish more like incentives and stuff, but the issue that we kind of run into is just like to transition to a DAO. Um, it's a lot of like legal complexity. Um, and so we've kind of just been like sifting through that, like, you know, from, from the foundation entity side, you need to kind of have all the final tax returns done. Right. Um, you need to have received kind of, you know, all the final kind of like IRS refunds and stuff. And then like, that's, it's probably going to be wrapped up in the next number of months, but it's taken a lot longer than, uh, than we thought kind of going in. Doesn't it always? Well, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and it's something that I think about a lot in in our space and like what we're doing here at the Stellar Development Foundation, is you said that someday the foundation will run out of money and fade away as it becomes like an ongoing community developed open source project. And that sort of, I mean, with the DAO, I, that's sort of where you're getting to. Um, and I love that idea because if you need the foundation to be central to sort of everything that happens with any with anything that you're doing, it becomes much more complicated because you want the community to sort of take over. So I really loved that. And it sounds like you're making it real with respect to Augur. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your investing. You have such a background in it. And I know you spent a lot of years at Pantera, um, but specifically, I want to focus on how you're looking at it in your new role at Founders Fund. Um, for our listeners who are unfamiliar, Founders Fund came about in 2005 with a big name roster of partners in the firm's portfolio companies, including Airbnb, SpaceX, and Stripe. Um, I read your blog where you wrote that you're going there to sort of shape the next decade of Founder Fund's crypto strategy. A decade is a long time, especially in our industry. So how are you approaching pulling that strategy together? Yeah. So I, th so I think if you think about, um, you know, what, what sort of makes, um, you know, those are two things, there's crypto stuff and there's founders fund stuff. And you could founders fund, you think about what makes like founders fund great, um, as, as, a, as a VC firm, you know, it's sort of founded as, as this sort of, you know, reactive thing, right. Where, you know, in 2005, a lot of the VC firms that existed were not exactly founder friendly. And so it's sort of founded, you know, by founders, a lot of the ex, you know, PayPal crew, um, for founders. And the idea is that, you know, we'll aggressively back, you know, really strong founders and, you know, stick with them every step of the way. Um, you know, if, and, and like the idea is like, even if you like disagree with someone on something, like you can tell them, but we'll never like force you to, to do something. Um, which I think is, is really important. Um, and then. If you look today, and then the other thing about Founders Fund is it's kind of always backed like these really, you know, zero to one kind of huge technological uh, shift style companies. Like one of our, you know, biggest investments is, is like SpaceX, right? Like it's literally launching reusable lock rockets uh, into space, um, which is, you know, a wild notion. And so if you think about like what's happening in crypto, you know, I think one is it's, it's you know, one of these really big, important kind of future technology platforms, right? You have like crypto, you have AI. You have biotech stuff, maybe one or two other things. But that's basically, you know, the the 
more main interesting things over the next decade. And then um, we want to be backing, you know, essentially the very best founders in crypto. Um, and so if you think about our strategy, you know, one thing that's a little different than if you're just a crypto only fund is we can invest in other stuff. In fact, we're generalist funds. So we invest in a lot of other stuff. And so when we look at companies, we're kind of comparing them across, you know, different sector. And so if we invest in a crypto company, we think it's one of the best companies we're seeing that year, you know, not just one of the best of the crypto companies. Yeah. Um, which I think is a differentiator. And then um, if you then kind of zoom in and look at it from a strategy standpoint, you know, my personal view right now anyways, is obviously the strategy will evolve. But right now, I think stage wise, you know, sort of seed through series B um, is sort of the most interesting kind of sweet spot for us. I think the the later stage you go, um, you know, the more expensive it, it, things get. And then also the less kind of zero to one they get, you know, businesses start to get a little bit less interesting, you know, when you're like doing like a series C or series D in crypto. Um, and so looking to mostly back kind of like the, the huge zero to one part of companies on the fairly early stage. And then, you know, we're looking to do equity tokens, both, you know, all the above, um, you know, we don't have any kind of, you know, restrictions or, or anything surrounding that there um, in terms of what we're willing to invest into. Um, and, and so from yeah. your, your focus is the crypto side, but you have knowledge of what the, what the firm is focused on, on the other parts, like outside of crypto. And so do you, do you want those to sort of, um, do you want those strategies to collide in any way so that they come together? Or do you, do you not think about it like that? Yeah, we don't think about it like that too much. It, it's more sort of like, you know, there's, there's, there's some limited quantity of you know, amazing companies in the world. And, you know, our objective is to invest in, you know, as, as many as possible, um, that, that are in that, that caliber. Um, and so I think like, you know, stuff, stuff ebbs and flows, right? Like sometimes you're doing, you know, more AI deals, less AI deals, more crypto deals, less yep. crypto deals. It kind of, it kind of depends on where you're at in the market cycle. I'd say right now, um, you know, in the market cycle, crypto feels pretty good. We're kind of mid bear market. I think mid bear market to mid bull market is the best time to be investing. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I think that, I mean, we're seeing a lot of really interesting companies right now. We have an enterprise fund that we invest out of, and it's the the companies that have survived through a lot of what's happened over the last year and a half um, are good, strong companies that are doing interesting work. And so I think that this is a great time to be looking uh, to invest. When you think about your strategy and you think about the crypto companies that you're focused on, um, how does the regulation, how does that come into your, your thought processes, especially because you guys are based in the US, you yourself might not be, but the Founders Fund is. And so how do you think about regulation, especially domestic regulation? Yeah, so I, I think from that, from that standpoint, um, you know, if you if you look at kind of how this stuff plays out, I think one is it, it'll take a long time to play out. Um, I mean, I just saw on Twitter this morning, you know, even the SEC responding to like Coinbase's um, recent thing and the SEC is like, oh, well, it's going to take us years to make rules. Um, <laughs> and you think about that, well, it's like, okay, um, they've been saying that for years. And well, actually, they've been saying there are no need for rules. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> and so now they're and, saying it's going to take us years to make rules, but yeah. Right. And, and so it's like, and so it's like, okay, um, you know, whoever's in charge of the SEC is probably not even going to be the same person by the time, you know, those rules even get seriously put together. Um, I think the stages that we're investing at too are fairly early. So regulatory risk is a bit of a smaller deal. Um, because by the time these companies have lots of users and are very, you know, big and popular, the regulatory environment could look completely different. Um, and so I hear some investors being like, oh, we're going to invest, you know, basically almost all overseas or whatever. And I'm like, no, like I'm just going to back the best founders. Um, you know, what makes me so happy to hear that because if you just ignore the US, you're just ignoring a huge amount of creativity and focus here. But also, you can't ignore the fact that regulation in the US is going to impact the users here and you want those users. And so you want to stay engaged. That makes me super happy to hear you say that. Now, when you're thinking about um, policy and you think about the fact that you said that you'll invest now and regulation will have likely changed by the time they get to the larger stage. How much influence do you want to have in terms of like you, you uh, individually, but also those that you work with in, in helping to shape the U S policy? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think like 
probably not a, not a ton. You know, I think, I think like, um, I think if basically like the way I describe it is like, if we, if we came out with, you know, some big views on policy or something it, it would probably kind of like, uh, you know, turbo turbocharge the issue, just given, um, you know, the FF brand and, and stuff. Um, but I think, but I think like, you know, there's certainly like over the years, um, you know, I've been to like, you know, had like a bunch of like meetings and lunches and stuff with, with people in Congress. And I've always kind of been happy to like, sort of like help them like understand the space. Cause I think like even more so than like trying to shape the exact regulation, which there's, there's kind of a lot of people involved doing that. Um, I think the biggest risk is just that, you know, people writing it don't understand what they're regulating. Um, and then that always results in bad regulation when, when you have someone who doesn't understand it, even at a high level. Um, and so I think like kind of the, the education piece is important. Um, but then also, you know, I think you also have this other dynamic, which is like right now crypto seems to have turned into like a hot button political issue where it's become like a Republican versus Democrat thing. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how that problem gets, gets, uh, fixed. I think FTX kind of messed that up a bit. Yeah, I think that's true. I do think that the way that we sort of stop the politicization, politicization of the issue is to really focus on the uses of crypto and blockchain. And I think that helps to sort of make it so that it's not, it's not, um, it's everyone's value and it's everyone's benefit. But, uh, and I think we're seeing a lot more of that, but yeah, I mean, it definitely feels a lot like that today. Um, but I think that uh, I think we're headed into. We have to see if they can come together. Stable coins, I thought, was the easy one, but we'll see mm -hmm. um, how that plays out. Uh, I do think it's so important, though, what you just said in terms of that education piece. If if you and others, that, and some, maybe some of the founders that that you work with, don't spend time just trying to educate, because trying to influence policy, part of that value is just really telling them about the tools that are being built. Uh, leveraging the technology. I think if we don't do that, then we sort of lose that connection to what it is that we ultimately want to see. So I'm really glad to hear that. I've actually been at those lunches, when, a couple of those lunches with you, and I found your engagement on those issues and then sort of just like the stark focus on like what it is that the companies are doing in the space is just really, really important. So I'd love for you to continue to do that. I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion here because I read something and you just mentioned a while ago, you're, you used to bet on horses. Uh, and that I read a story about you wanting a horse, um, when you were younger, do you still ride horses today? Uh, yeah, I still ride horses. Um, like maybe a month ago, my girlfriend and I went, went riding on the beach actually in, in Puerto Rico. It was really nice. So I just, yesterday, I just started, um, I'm, I took, I'm taking lessons. I grew up around horses, but I'm taking lessons again. Cause I just am not, um, that comfortable around them now. And, but I started Western and I just did a lesson yesterday and it's just amazing being on a horse and having that kind of strength um, with you, working with you, sometimes working against you. So how did you, why did you get so connected to that idea of it when you were younger? Um, yeah, it's an, inter it's an interesting question. Um, so, so I think like I, it was kind of just coincidentally, you know, uh, my, my parents were at some dinner or something. And so um, the, the neighbor, the neighbor kid was watching us cause he's a bit older than us. And, um, you know, we rode bikes over to this, these stables cause he used to like mow their, the front kind of like paddock area, you know, in front. Um, and, and basically he, he like showed us the horses, let us pet them and stuff. And, um, and it ended up basically, I ended up kind of just like realizing that horses were really cool. Um, and, and started riding and started taking lessons. Um, and then eventually, eventually got a horse, but, um. I think, I think the thing that I like about them is they're, they're like, you know, these really kind of like powerful, intelligent creatures. And when you're riding horses, you kind of have to like, um, it's sort of like a dance with the horse where you have to kind of like figure out, um, how to communicate with them. And, and it's like, it's this very kind of like subtle kind of communication. Um, and like, you're not like fully in control, but you can do things that are like, you know, I like, like, this is good, like, like positive EV for like, for like, you know, making things, you know, work smoother. Um, it's, it's sort of like very funnily and ironically, a lot of the things I like about financial markets are kind of like the similar things that I like about horses, where it's just like this complicated thing that like, you're not fully in control of, but you can like, sort of like, try to understand.
Oh my gosh. I absolutely love that. I will tell you that yesterday my instructor said, you need to sit up straighter because the horse can feel you slouch. So you need to sit up straighter. And she said, would you want to follow somebody or be led by somebody who's slouching? (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking, wow, that's like a total metaphor for life. Um, But I love that. That's like such a great way to think about the horses and also connecting it to the financial markets because it is true. You can't control them, but you can work with them. Uh, And that's so much of what we have. So what makes an exceptional crypto founder in your view? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in my view, it's sort of, um, you know, are are they able to kind of burst through walls to to solve the problems that they're trying to solve? Are they super passionate about solving the problem that they want to solve? Like, you know, are you opinionated about what that problem might be? Or are you just let them define the problem and then you're interested in how they're how they're solving it or how they're going about it? Yeah, I have opinions on the problems too. Like, like, like I, I'd say there's, there's some stuff where I think that, you know, a problem's not that interesting or it's, or it's a small market or whatever. Um, the, the founder piece dominates though, but I do have views on markets. Like I, I remember I looked back at kind of the most successful investments I made at Pantera and half of them were actually things where I found a market and a problem that I really liked. And then I went out and tried to find the best team in that area. And then the other half were just things where, you know, great teams came inbound and I backed them kind of independent of my views on how far along the product was or whatever. And so it's about the person. Is it about the team as well? Do you spend a lot of time with the management teams? Yeah. So basically, basically spend a lot of time with like the founders and then also, you know, depending on stage, um, you know, some of the, some of the key employees as well. Um, mostly trying, trying to figure out like, are these people able to hire well? Um, are they able to convince people to join their company? Are they going to be able to, you know, fund fundraise? Um, and then, you know, do they have like a crisp kind of compelling vision for, for what they're building? Um, I'd say the biggest mistakes I've made in investing are um, numbers look good, um, but the team isn't, isn't like A plus. Um, and I actually had a funny conversation with someone from Founders Fund about this, uh, who who does a lot of the growth investing there. And, you know, they're like, you know, basically at later stages, um, you know, you either have to like know the numbers at the most intricate, deepest level possible. Um, and if and if and if you're not gonna go to that level of depth, you're better off just evaluating on team. <laughs> you know, it's sort it's sort of like poker, right? Like like it, you, you can read people or you can look at the numbers and stuff, but but if you look at the numbers at a very surface level. Um, yeah, you're, you're probably gonna, if they look good, there's probably some secret thing underneath that that you need to find to get to the actual reality. That's so true. And so today when you're thinking about where to look in terms of what, what market or what, um, what problem you're looking at, um, how are you given the, the craziness of what's going on from a regulatory standpoint, and also just how companies have not been able to be successful in this market, how are you defining what's, are you looking at problems or are you looking at, uh, the founders like or is it both still um yeah I, th- I think i think mostly looking at um mostly looking at founders i'd say problem wise there's some there's some areas that i'm excited about like there's a lot of kind of infrastructure around um kind of the layer two scaling space right now so that's sort of interesting um there's also i think some still still some interesting stuff um in the DeFi space um i think there's like this notion that um you know, Uniswap is all you need, um, and compounds all you need. And I think, I think whenever you have that in tech, um, it's always like, it's, it's actually a great opportunity for disruption because one stuff isn't getting funded that much. And so if you are able to get funded and get some traction, you can build a huge moat because, because everyone else is afraid to try to take on the behemoth. Um, and the story of tech is always, you know, monopolies disrupting monopolies, right? So like, so like the, the idea that someone has dominant market share means they're going to have it forever is just usually wrong. Well, and doesn't that also mean if someone has dominant market share and they have it for a really long time, innovation is sort of stymied. And so then it's a great time to disrupt. Like that's, yeah, it's like the circle that keeps happening and happening. Uh, so you're a Thiel fellow and also an Edmund Hillary fellow. I was really interested in the Edmund Hillary fellow because normally it, there's a connection to um New Zealand. And I just wondered, like, how did you have, it doesn't all, I know nobody, not everybody has to be connected there, but did you have a connection to New Zealand when you decided to do that fellowship? So, so yeah, not, not, not really initially. So, so I, I sort of, um, 
yeah, I sort of met them through um, uh, Fred Ashram from from Coinbase like years ago. It was like, hey, I'm doing, going to this dinner in San Francisco. You want to come? It, it was about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And then, long story short, that's how that's how I ended up coming across them. Um, I do think New Zealand is super super cool and a very okay. very interesting uh, place. Me too. And I think even for crypto right now, Australia and New Zealand are both like really, really interesting places where I'm seeing a lot of really great development, even at the uh, at the the traditional financial level. Um, they seem more interested than domestically here in the U.S. Uh, so in terms of those types of fellowships, did you feel like they really both of them sort of propelled you forward in a different way? Uh, and what I'm really looking at is like people out there that are considering whether they should do one. Is that something that you recommend? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the um, I think the um, the Teal Fellowship stuff was was super interesting um, because I think the, the the thing that's interesting about it um, is the the community of people around it are um, obviously working on all very very different problems, um, but they're all similar in the sense that they're you know very ambitious, very smart people who are all you know pretty young. Um, and so it's a great community of people to like talk to you about stuff. Um, you know, that I, you know, I still have friends that I met, you know, just randomly through, through Teal Fellowship stuff in the early days. Um, and then the Edmund Hillary stuff is, is kind of similar community, um, in the sense that it has a community, but very different community. Cause it's, it's kind of a much more, um, diverse community of people, I'd say, cause there's like, there's some people working on startups, there's some people like working in government, some people working on nonprofits. Um, so it's a, it's a much wider range of people. The thing that ties them together is, you know, some sort of interest in uh, New Zealand somehow. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so things move so fast in this space, but also um, kind of in life. Uh, so my question is, are there any mistakes or missed opportunities that stand out to you in your recent experience? And, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, um, I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but I, I do keep a list actually of every mistake I've made that's like, that, that that's um you know I, that I consider to be like a, a major mistake. How do you define major uh, mistake? Um, like like to me, it's um basically like like the the EV was like like if I if I had not made the mistake, it it would have made um an additional million dollars is kind of is kind of the the threshold. <laughs> um, so they mostly are investing mistakes. Um, I do have some stuff on there that's not dollar quantifiable. That's 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 also on there, but. The investing ones, I would say, are um, are, are things like you know backing something that that you know has has great numbers, but the team is not is not an A plus team. Like that's a thing that I'm not going to make that mistake again. Um, also, a bunch of mistakes was like you know trading um, in the early days. Um, I would say investing wise, um, you know, the, another one thing I found is that you can sometimes be right about your macro thesis. But if there's a really good entrepreneur, um, you may still want to back them. And so an example of this is I pass on the early rounds of Solana because um, my thesis was that most developers are going to build on EVM ecosystem, layer twos on top of that, you know, things like Starkware, Arbitrum, Optimism, which is sort of right. Like 80% of the pitches I see are in that ecosystem somehow. Um, but it was like wrong in the sense that um, there is still like 5% or so that I see is built on Solana. And that caused Solana to be worth a lot of money, especially if you passed on like, you know, the, early days, the very first few yeah. rounds. Um, and the team was just really, really sharp. It's so like, that's an example of something where I think like, you know, you, you sort of got it half right, half wrong. And uh, the area you got it wrong actually is so high expected value that you should have just made the bet anyway. Um, that's probably the biggest miss I have. And so when you write them down, do you, what's the, what propels you to look at that list again? Um, I'd say sometimes I look at it if I'm making like a big, a big, like, um, investment decision, I'll sometimes skim through it just to make sure I'm not repeating any mistake that I've made in the past. Um, it's just a reminder. Um, I'll also just kind of periodically scroll through it maybe like once a quarter, um, just to remind myself of, of the major mistakes I've made so I don't make them again. Um, uh, and then obviously the, the third, um, the third time I look at it is if I, if I unfortunately need to add something to it. Uh, those are the those are the three scenarios. And how long is it now? Um, I don't know it's maybe like it's maybe like twenty or thirty items long, something like that. 
That's a really that's interesting. That's the thing about investing. Yeah. You make a lot, you make a lot of mistakes, but, but like, as long as you're, you're still getting, you know, a good amount of the, the really good investments in your portfolio, you can have a mistake list that's very long and, and it still works out fine. Well, and do you have the list on the other side where it's telling you of your successes or do you just know those inherently? You, you kind of just know them and, and, and you never, I, I never want to tell myself my successes too much. You know, you don't want it to go to your head. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of like, um, you know, I, I have a sort of like, you know, you know, like you, you kind of want to, um, you know, make, make, make sure that you're reminded of your mistakes and then of your successes, you know, just, it's kind of like, if you're not making mistakes, there's the successes and, 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 um, you don't want to keep that in too front of mind. Words to live by. Joey, I am so glad that we had the opportunity to sit down and have this conversation. Um, it's been a while since we've been able to talk. We used to be on a board together, and now I feel like uh, we don't get to, I don't get to see you very often, and this is awesome to be able to do that. One last question. Where can people keep up with you and your work? Yeah, so um, I'm on Twitter um, and Telegram, just at Joey Krug, all lowercase, no spaces. Um, and then I'm also, if you want to send me a pitch deck or anything, uh, joey at foundersfund.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joey. So great to see you. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Block by Block. Don't forget to subscribe to get notified when new episodes are released and follow me on Twitter to stay in the loop in between episodes. I'll talk to you next time.